The path to mastery leads through the heart of adversity. Challenge is the raw material from which courage and strength are forged. Warriors are not defined by events. Warriors define them. Warriors conquer themselves before all else. Warriors are relentless in their service to others. Join us as we open our hearts and hone our minds to a razor's edge. It doesn't matter how slow you go, only that you do not stop. Your time is now. And now your host, Jason McKenzie. Well, hello, my masculinity redefining friends. I'm recording this on Saturday morning. It's early, hence the huskiness of my voice. I feel like my voice gets more nasal as I go throughout the day, but regardless, uh, you're going to love this episode. So first, I wanted to talk to you about the Dad Edge Alliance, which is a group run by my good friend, Larry Hagner. And it is, well, so he's the founder of the Good Dad Project, and he's the founder of the Dad Edge, or the host of the Dad Edge Project, which is a podcast, rather, which just gets such an amazing amount of downloads. It's just, he's, it's such a good show. He's such a cool guy. He asks great questions, but, you know, because he's a good friend of mine, he's just such a real dude. Like, he's just, just a guy like everybody else, you know, and trying to make a difference in the world and, figuring it all out. And one of the things he's done is he started a membership community called the Dad Edge Alliance. It's about 250 guys in there or so at the time of this recording. And it is the most incredible community of kind, compassionate, and caring, ass-kicking men. Like, you know, and it's it's such a cool thing to be immersed in a group of people where you can see that those two things don't have to be mutually, like those those concepts don't have to be mutually exclusive. And let me tell you, the power, the people you surround yourself with it has such an incredibly powerful impact on your life. It's, I always like, I, I kind of knew that logically, like in my head at some point, but I could never have imagined what it is like to be around a group of men of this caliber. And it literally is yours. If you, you know, if there's an application process because Larry is absolutely, uh, adamant that only the right men join this community so it maintains its integrity and motivation and drive and and the essence of what the the dad edge is but i mean literally for 67 bucks a month with there's barely more than your gym membership it is mind-boggling what you get for that money not only you get access to all these incredible guys but you get uh you get community calls team calls like world-class experts coming in like it's just nuts who this guy gets to come in and talk to the guys in the group so if you want to find out more about it, and if you are a guy and a dad, you're insane if you don't want to find out more about it. That's the bottom line. But go over to gooddadproject.com slash alliance and check it out. And like I said, Larry is like one of the best guys I've ever met. Just such a cool dude. So if you're looking to change your life, this is a very fast way to begin the process of doing it. Okay, now on to the episode. So this is kind of on the theme of men and redefining masculinity. My guest this week is Don McCreary, who is a really cool guy, actually, that lives in uh, Toronto. And he takes an interesting, like, this conversation is interesting because he is an expert on, you know, men's health, workplace stress, stress, health and resilience. And, and, he takes kind of a research based, or this is kind of like a research based conversation on men and masculinity. And he's done work with the, the military. So, I mean, if ever there was a, you know, sort of organization and organizational culture that was <laughs> what you would typically define as like uber macho, uh, this one is it. And you know, it's funny. I spent some time in the military, uh, when I was younger and it is a culture that is like I, I don't know how different it is now. I mean, talking to Don, it's it's changing, uh, but there's obviously a long way to go. But holy moly, it was a culture that was unlike anything you could ever imagine. So, um, yeah, so we, we just talk about that and talk about some of the research that Don's done and, uh, you know, what it means to sort of start rethinking and redefining manhood and, you know, doing it in, uh, you know, a crucible of a, you know, pretty intense environment. So, he, Don is a, a Toronto-based international scientific consultant, and he specializes in the following areas. So men health, workplace stress, 
Health and Resilience Survey Questionnaire Design and Analysis, and Human Research Ethics Review. He's a highly experienced senior scientist, and he's worked on a wide variety of applied research contexts over 20 years, including military, first responder, healthcare environments, as well as for non-profit organization. And he owns DRM Scientific Consulting. Um, and I'll include the links to all that stuff in the show notes page. But let's just put it this way. When I was talking to Don, you know, not that he did anything specific to make me feel this way other than just being himself. But, you know, I'm talking to the guy and I'm realizing it is incredible how much smarter and how much more educated this guy is than I am. So I always like having those conversations with people because it's nice to see. It's nice to interact with people who are sort of on another level of of education and uh, research and analytical capabilities and, you know, basically basically people that don't drag their knuckles along the ground when they walk, like myself. So enjoy this conversation, and we were going to see you on the other side. And Don, welcome to the Mental Health Warriors podcast. Thanks for the invitation, Jason. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this chat. I want to be really clear up front, though. We talked about this when we talked previously, but you're a highly educated man, and I have a highly educated audience. But the host of this podcast is not highly educated. So if we can keep her to about two syllables a word or less, I mean, that'll be good for me. Well, that's typically what I aim for. But uh, if I'm failing miserably, just uh, let me know. I'm happy to uh, change my uh, change my, my approach. So just that's say awesome. the word. All right. Sounds good. So your focus, your professional focus is – actually, before we talk about your professional focus, there's a question I have as I was uh, reviewing your – uh, profile before we uh, got on the call today. What is an adjunct professor? Oh, an adjunct professor is someone who is affiliated with the university because he or she is you know, uh, a professional researcher. And uh, that affiliation uh, basically allows me to use that university's name whenever I publish something in the scientific literature. Uh, or if I wish to, um, you know, go to a, an academic conference, I can say that I'm I'm with them. So they pre-vet me first off, and uh, and I've been with uh, Brock University as an adjunct professor since about 1993. Although whenever I've moved around the country, uh, I've held a separate adjunct appointments at other local universities as well. But uh, the the one at Brock is pretty much stuck. Uh, I got involved quite. Uh, early on in my career there, uh, met some great people and established some great uh, relationships with the people there. And uh, and I've stuck with uh, that affiliation throughout my career. Wonderful. Okay, so your focus, your professional focus is in a couple of different areas. One is uh, men's health, I guess you'd say, and the other one is mm -hmm. resilience. And uh, is that an accurate portrayal before we get started? Yeah, the men's health is something that I've been doing, uh, you know, pretty much all my career. So from the you know, mid to late 80s onwards, uh, starting about the early 1990s, I started developing a research expertise in the area of stress, coping and resilience, uh, especially in the workplace. So the last uh, from 2001 onwards, I worked for the Department of National Defense, uh, focusing on, uh, you know, uh, job related stress and the impact it has on uh, people's uh, psychological health and physical well-being uh, as a result of uh, those who work in or among those who work in high-risk occupations like the military and first responders. Okay, perfect. So as it comes to men's health and your specific area of interest in it, what's the state of the union today? Oh, the state you know, of the union in terms of where we are, it's growing in interest, but there is still a lot about men's health we don't know. Uh, for example, uh, we still don't know exactly what areas there are out there in which men have greater morbidity. In other words, what areas do men get sick more, you know, for example, than women? Uh, and what areas is there a greater degree of mortality? So we do know those in some areas, but we don't know them in all areas. And then once we do know them, the big question becomes why? Uh, how much of it is, you know, biological? And the prevailing answer from some of the big major literature reviews is, you know, about maybe half of the variability 
you know, amongst men in, uh, you know, uh, can be attributed to their, uh, to their biological makeup. But more than half or about half or maybe slightly more than half is the way we socialize men. So in other words, male role norms or masculinity uh, plays a large part in men's health. So we need to know more about the areas in which, you know, men have a higher degree of morbidity and mortality. And also when they do have, you know, uh, this greater risk, we need to understand why. And we're still, in my opinion, we still have a long way to go in both those areas. How much do you think, I mean, I, that's one of the things we talk about on the show a lot is, is male social norms. And how much do you think social isolation has to do with that increase in morbidity? Because I'm really becoming quite interested in it lately. And I never, I knew it was, uh, you know, non-optimal or I didn't understand how devastating it really was. And I think part of that for me and my own personal experience was that, you know, I felt so uh pressured not not really like ex, you know pressured just by to conform i guess uh, the pressure of conformity uh, that i i really isolated myself because i first of all i didn't let myself really know myself which i think if you from my experience you can't really have a c deep connection with other people if you don't have a deep connection with yourself but how much do those norms anyways um increase or contribute to the social isolation that men feel oh that is a difficult question and one that really we're just now beginning to explore. So for example, we know that social isolation is something that is an, you know, is, can sometimes be an outcome, for example, of depression. So we know that when people experience depression, especially men, they tend to isolate themselves, you know, from others. Um, but how much of that is a function of the disorder and how much of it is, is a function of sort of a traditional masculine or male role norm, you know, response to the, you know, the disorder? Uh, and we don't really know, but it is a common, it's something that we hear commonly, you know, when we, uh, when we talk to men who, for example, are experiencing, you know, anxiety and depression uh, or uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, that their main reaction is to, in essence, isolate themselves. And part of that, you know, from what we've heard is that it's exhausting trying to manage, you know, uh, the way you are in the outside world when you already lack you know, a lot of uh, ability to control your emotions because, for example, depression or PTSD, you're trying to cope with that. So you don't really have a lot of energy left over to, you know, uh, to, you know, to manage how you interact or to manage your, um, oh, I'm blanking on the, on the word, but, uh, you know, to manage your impressions, the impressions that you're trying to give to others, you know, in a social situation. So it's easier to isolate yourself. But the other uh, element there is that by isolating yourself, you are not showing, you know, that weakness so, to other people. You're, in other words, you're able to, you know, preserve that sense of external strength uh, because no one's going to see you in a, you know, in a, you know, to, to see you in a way that isn't strong, that isn't, you know, tough. And, uh, and so that kind of, uh, is a self-protective mechanism as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I, uh, yeah, I know that I definitely went through that as well. It's just a, a real acute fear of being seen as someone who is not strong. So does, yeah. And, but does also Jason, sometimes, you know, uh, as you said earlier, uh, sometimes there is a correlation between, uh, adopting traditional male role norms and a psychological you know, disorder called alexithymia. And alexithymia is being cut off from your emotions. So the men who internalize more traditional male role norms tend to have higher levels of alexithymia. So they tend to be more cut off from their, uh, you know, from their emotions. And so what that in essence means is that more traditional men don't really know themselves as well as less traditional men. Now, again, this, these are correlations. It's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's a small to moderate correlation. So I'm not saying that, you know, that every man who's high in traditional male role norms is going to feel this way or the same way. There may be some, some men who don't really subscribe to traditional male role norms, but they also, but they may be 
you know, uh, cut off from the, or somewhat cut off from uh, from their emotions. But the the key thing here is that not quite knowing who you are, you know, is um, and and what your what the emotions are that you're feeling can be a very scary thing for men, and uh, and that can also lead one to. Uh, you know, to self 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 isolate and to try and uh, you know and uh, and sort of not put themselves out there, you know, uh, where people can see some of the uh, some of the confusion or maybe some of the embarrassment, you know, that uh, they may be experiencing, you know, in certain situations. How I hope that makes sense. See... Anyway, no, no, that makes total sense. How often do you see men, you know, when they experience these emotions? And I mean. I... I guess men probably like I did get pretty good at, 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 you know, either not acknowledging them or, or pushing them down somehow, but when they're exposed to, you know, increased levels of stress, I guess, how many men see these emotions, they surface, uh, and they don't know what they are and they, ca or they cause fear in them because they don't know what's happening to them. And then they self-medicate, right. To try to get rid of them, to get back to some sort of status quo. Yeah, no, I would, I would imagine that that's fairly common. We don't have any data on you know, we, the, the the way you formulated the question suggests we maybe we might be able to sort of you know throw out a percentage of men who do this, but unfortunately, we're not able to do that. We don't we we don't collect data in a way that allows us to sort of say fifty percent or forty percent or seventy percent of men do this. But we do. But from a from what our theories tell us and from what our correlational data tell us, there is a strong correlation between both conforming or wanting to conform to traditional male role norms, as well as the stress that you can experience when you fear that you're not meeting those male role norms and substance abuse. And we often think of substance abuse from a self-medication stress reduction hypothesis. So one of the main reasons why, you know, we may, you know, uh, these men may want to drink more is to help quell the anxiety that they're experiencing, in part maybe because they feel they are not meeting society's definitions for how a real man, quote unquote, uh, should behave in a given situation. Or maybe in some situations, men might find themselves forced to act in a way that is traditionally feminine. And some men find that very stressful. Other men, they don't really care. But again, because some men do find that stressful, it may be amongst those men that they may, you know, find themselves self-medicating a little bit more with, with alcohol or with other substances. What's an example of a situation a man might find himself in? Where we'd have to take on a more feminine role. I'm thinking, like, what popped into my head was raising daughters, for example. But I'm not sure if there's something else. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. For example, uh, going to the doctor and kind of being forced to, you know, you, you know, doctors' offices in the past, maybe not so much now, maybe not all of them now, but you know, they used used to walk in and all the posters on the uh, on the walls. You know, were directed at uh, their female patients uh, because again those those are the patients who are most regularly you know going to see them either alone or with you know with children typically um, and uh, you know the the people behind the desk you know the nurses and the administrative staff are almost all women uh, and some you know there's a lot of evidence out there from uh, from our interviews with men that suggests that men find traditional uh, doctors' offices to be very you know feminine you know and geared towards Towards women, and they may actually feel, you know, um, you know, feel stress having to go. And then on top of all of that, you have to disclose if you're having a problem. And uh, a lot of men have a fear of being told, "Oh, it's nothing." You know, why are you whining? Why are you whinging? And um, and so that can cause them stress as well. You know, not only just letting people know that you're not as strong as you are, and that you are admitting a form of, you know, a, a form of weakness and that uh, you know, there's a there's a fear of being told, oh, it, you know, it's nothing. You know, you, you know, you're 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 just making too much out of this, and uh, so that can actually cause you know uh, them stress. Now, I'm not saying that you know men come home from the doctors and uh, and go have a drink, but uh, but that's one type of situation which you know, 
that may, may be considered to be feminized that men may find themselves in. And, and when you look at the data, you find that uh, amongst those who haven't seen a doctor in five or more years, the majority of them are men. Uh, a lot of men hold it as a point of pride not to um, have been to a doctor, you know, for a long time, you know, that, uh, you know, if I'm feeling a little bit off, you know, then I'll just uh, suck it up, you know, and take a few, uh, you know, Tylenol, aspirin, whatever, and, uh, and just deal with it. Geez, that sounds a lot like me. I, and, I, I can't even I, remember the last time I've been to the doctor. Uh, well, yeah, okay. Here's the uh, the point of confession for me is I, I'm a men's health specialist, but I'm also a man. And uh, that means that there are lots of times I don't practice what I preach. And uh, I had a point of pride where I hadn't been to a doctor for almost 10 years. I'd been to a walk-in clinic every once in a while. Okay, you go to a walk-in clinic, you get a round of antibiotics, you know, and away you go. Yeah, you know, and uh, unfortunately now it's uh, it's like okay, six month checkups. Yeah, you know, here you go, and uh, or year or yearly checkups, depending on, uh, on on how things are going physically. How does I'm interested in talking about your role as a researcher, but how does do those social norms uh, flow into academia? For example, like I was listening to a podcast yesterday where there was a, a physics professor talking and he was basically talking about how male centric the field was. And so are those, are those norms as far as who goes into what type of research, like, and, and all that kind of stuff, are those as prevalent in academia as they are in maybe the, the rest of society? Oh, okay. We're talking. Okay. I know a little bit about this. Um, you know, a bit of uh, you know, a plug. In, in 2010, I published a, uh, I co-edited a two-volume handbook of gender research in psychology with my colleague Joan Chrysler in the in the U.S. And it was 51 chapters and about 16 or 1700 book pages. So I got to read a little bit about this. And uh, the answer is that in some areas and some disciplines uh, within the scientific community, yes, there uh, there is a prevalent, still a prevalence of uh, men in the field, and that can be either within the student body and the faculty, or it can be in uh, the in the faculty, but not necessarily the student body. And some places, for example, that are changing, you still have a, uh, a predominance of male faculty in, say, the senior echelons, you know, the, uh, the senior, the full professors, the deans, uh, the vice presidents, etc., but not so much in the junior faculty. And uh, sometimes we see things like that change. For example, when I first started out uh, in psychology back in the early 80s, it was a fairly even gender split. And now a lot of the, most of the students are women and a lot of uh, the junior and mid-level faculty are women. But from the data I've seen, we still have a lot of senior faculty, you know, overall who are still men. And that also varies within sub-disciplines, you know, within the, air, within the field. So a lot of the more experimental, you know, areas, a lot of the more senior, you know, uh, faculty still tend to be men, but in the more uh, applied areas like clinical psychology, for example, a lot of the senior faculty, you know, or maybe there, there may be more of a balance, you know, um, you know, male to female. But when you get into engineering and some of the more hard sciences, uh, I, I believe that there is still a, it's still a fairly male dominated profession uh, in academia. I don't know so much about how the, I know that there's been a push to get women in at the undergraduate level, but I've also been hearing so much about uh, some of the, you know, the troubles and harassment that uh, a lot of the female students uh, face at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. Um, so there's the push to get them in, but can you keep them in if you create and promote a toxic environment for them? Again, th these are the kinds of discussions that are, that are happening in the field. Well, speaking of that toxic environment, I mean, how much of these male social norms and expectations contribute to that toxicity? So whether it's things like, I don't know, I mean, anything from sexual assault to domestic violence to even even maybe, you know, unhealthy or maybe har I mean, harassment at, at the workplace. Like, is that men... It, it, from your understanding, is that men acting like they think they're supposed to? Is it men not having enough emotional awareness to understand what's what's happening inside them? Or what is what are some of the causes of that? 
Oh, causes. Oh, that is an interesting, you know, question. And, uh, you know, it's something that is still, in essence, it's still something we're grappling with. So what, what I can tell you is if you take a look at, uh, at the research, and there's some really interesting research in this area, you know, what you find is that men who endorse more traditional male role norms, that they are more likely to believe in um, you know, for example, uh, or sorry, they're probably less likely, you know, to believe in uh, sort of equal rights for women. They're more likely to believe in so-called, you know, not so-called, they're actual rape myths. Uh, but they're also less likely to believe in uh, in gender equality, feminism, and so forth. They're all, you know, men who internalize more traditional male role norms also they have a greater tendency to, uh, you know, to commit or yeah, I guess you'd want to commit, you know, uh, you know, intimate partner violence. I think is uh, is would be is the phrase that's that's used now. So uh, you know, they're more likely to physically, you know, and emotionally, you know, abuse, you know, the uh, the female partners in their lives. But again, that that, that is correlational data. Um, and what is behind that? So we don't necessarily know you know why some men again because of these are correlations the correlations aren't perfect some men with traditional male role norms don't act this way and some do uh but we do know that, that there is a a tendency you know uh in that direction so what is it that is uh you know that is causing some men to act this way you know and others not and we haven't quite worked that out yet um there's a really new interesting area within uh, the masculinity field is called precarious masculinity. And the precarious masculinity concept basically says that being labeled a man, you know, is something that is conferred on men by other men. And that in order to keep that label, they always have to be acting in manly ways and that that label of being a man can be taken away by them, by others, you know, uh, for failures not to act like a man. So if you have some men who are very concerned about, uh, you know, maintaining traditional male role norms, they're going to be acting more often, more frequently, uh, more consistently in traditionally masculine ways and a traditionally masculine way one of those elements is well there are four main elements status toughness power over others and anti-femininity so those four elements are going to be key to the way that they interact with the world and you get you know you get violence you get you know you know towards others both other men and women you know as part of that uh, and you get um, dominance towards others, you know, wanting to be dominant over others as, as, a, as a correlate of that as well. So there are lots of correlates. But again, the correlations aren't strong enough to say that every man who believes in conforming to these traditional male role norms act this way. So there are other factors at play. And what we don't quite know yet is, well, what are those other factors? And uh, there is a small cadre of researchers out there studying that, but it's, uh, you know, it's a growing field, but it is still, you know, I would say nascent. It's really only been since the mid eighties that, uh, that researchers have really started to devote time in a large, larger group, you know, uh, to asking these questions, studying these questions and trying to find answers. So you mentioned in your in your last answer that you know masculinity is a concept that's conferred by other men. I I wonder, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. Like women must get this roughly the same uh, definition of what it means to be a man as men get. I would think, or maybe I'm wrong with mm -hmm. that assumption. But mm -hmm. but how nope. much of yeah, so sometimes I wonder how much men actually fear being having their masculine status taken away by men or the, versus having it actually taken away by women. Because sometimes I wonder if women contribute to it because they believe a man should be the same thing and men failing their women in something as fundamental as their own masculinity. I know terrifies some men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say that that you are right. Yeah, we teach women about male role norms as well. And they are 
what we call in psychology socializing agents. So, you know, women socialize and, you know, and, main, you know, and help men maintain masculinity to the same extent that, uh, that men do. Uh, and, you know, they, they do that through reward and punishment, you know, rewarding, you know, desirable behavior, punishing undesirable behavior. And, uh, yeah, so they are, they are socializing agents to the same extent that men are, but, you know, do they have the same power to socialize men that other men have? And you could argue that in some situations, yes, but in a lot more situations, probably the, the, the men in men's lives probably have even more power, you know, than women do in most situations. But again, you know, you ask the, you ask the question, some men might actually be more, um, they may be more concerned with this than others. Some men may not care what others think about them. But again, those who really feel the need to conform to this the most, they may be the most, I would say, vulnerable to this kind of socializing. Okay, gotcha. Now, I'm sure there's men that are listening to this who are saying, you know, especially especially people of like my father's generation, for example, would be listening to this saying, for God's sakes, just man up. Okay, look, <laughs> we... It, it was, we were men, you know, we went through World War II. We, 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 you know, built the economy after World War II. We went and we got things done. And now that you guys are like, you know, frolicking on the backs of our labor, you have all this time to be so self-absorbed and, and to explore what it means to be a man. Well, we, we just got things done. I mean, do you still hear stuff like that today? And how do you, how do you answer that if you do? Well, yeah, of course we do. Um, you know, there, you know, there's always, you know, that, that other opinion is just like, yeah, like you said, you know, man up or just, you know, shut up and take it like a man. Um, you know, that kind of, uh, of mentality. And it's kind of like, okay, we, we know that there are good elements to masculinity. So we're not saying that, and I'm not saying that masculinity is bad. I'm saying that, you know, sometimes the way masculinity is expressed can have negative consequences for men's physical health, their psychological well-being, and the way they interact with others. In other words, the harm that they can do to others versus the good that they can do to others. And psychology, our role is to try and improve the health and well-being you know, of everybody within our culture. So what our discipline is trying to do is trying to learn and understand the ways in which masculinity is harmful to men so that we can, you know, tell these men in these situations, in these contexts, you know, this is not beneficial and that you may want to, you know, consider some other option, or you may want to dial it back a little bit, or you may want to focus on taking, you know, that masculine sense and applying it in a more positive way. So that's usually, you know, what I end up saying when I hear this kind of, uh, you know, of element. So there, there are, you know, some men out there who think that you, I'm just male bashing or that the people in my field are just male bashing. But uh, the, the, the idea is we're really trying to understand the ways in which masculinity harms men and others and trying to right that wrong in a way that improves everybody's well-being, you know, health and happiness. What are some of the changes that you've seen, say, over the past, uh, say, 10 years or, or whatever the time frame is you pick, but that leave you optimistic about where we're headed? Well, I see a younger generation who, well, okay, let me step back. Uh, I'm often asked to come and give talks, you know, on, you know, masculinity, men's health, uh, or, you know, uh, you know, men, masculinity and mental health. You know, I have variations, you know, uh, you know on, a, on a talk or a workshop. And, uh, some, you know, and I'll be talking a lot about the negative elements of masculinity and all about the individual differences, you know, that I've been talking about in conforming to male role norms, but how some men really have a need to conform, other men don't care at all, and most men are kind of in the middle, you know, it kind of depends on the context kind of thing. And I'll often have young men come up to me and I'll say, they'll, they'll tell me that they don't really follow those traditional male role norms anymore. 
And what I take from that is, and from what I hear elsewhere, is that the millennial generation, you know, is uh, is one that isn't as concerned. In other words, there are probably fewer men at the top end trying to conform than there have been in the past. That more men are maybe down, you know, in the I could I don't I could care less kind of category or group, you know, um, compared to previous generations, and you know that's. That for me is kind of optimistic. So they're able to sort of, they're able to take gender and they're able to say, I like this element. I don't like that element. That element I find, you know, is not working for me. It's harmful. It doesn't do me, you know, any good. It doesn't do the people around me any good. And I'm just going to get rid of it. And, and I like that notion. But at the same time, you know, these are people who have to work within the larger community. And, uh, you know, and I often wonder, well, what's going to happen to them when they go out into the real world and, uh, and they're working within a larger context in which, you know, gender role norms, you know, they do mean something. And, you know, men and women, you know, can get punished for violating these traditional male role norms. To give you an example, there was a study out of Australia you know, last year uh, that showed that amongst men and women who asked for a workplace accommodation for mental health concerns, men were 50% more likely to have those requests turned back to them. And the reasons given were, it's going to hurt your career. In other words, so that's a very male stereotypic perspective. It's kind of like, you know, men, careers, that's your goal. And uh, so for these younger men who are now working in an environment where they really don't care as much, you know, about that link between masculinity and careerism, you know, uh, what will happen to them and how will they, you know, adapt to, you know, to uh, working in an environment that still supports some of these traditional male role norms. So I'm hopeful on the one hand, and my question, not my question, but my my hope is that they'll be able to change some of those uh, those beliefs and those stereotypes uh, as they play out in the workforce. Yeah, I'm pretty optimistic about that. I've seen this firsthand, and I, I think the best uh, weapon in this, maybe to use a traditionally male <laughs> uh, metaphor, but is is that people that you know do not slavishly conform to these stereotypes depending on the context, but they, of course, but they can be much more effective that as a, for example, as a leader or as a peer, because they create an environment that creates a deeper sense of human connection with people when they're actually just being themselves. So while they may not conform to a traditional male, you know, social norm, they become much more effective at influencing events within their organization because of the relationships they form. And I think that is going to be from just from my own personal experience and with like, as myself as well, I think that will be the the uh, benefit that continues to drive this change forward. Because people that are just you know this is what it means to be a man, this is what it means to treat people. They they sure they were they got to a certain point that that was you know that was effective for a time for a time. But I don't think over the long term it can compete with with what some of the the millennials are doing now. No, and uh, I have to admit I'm not I. My nature is not to be as optimistic as that, but I see so much great stuff out there. So I do a lot of volunteer work with the Movember Foundation. Uh, I've been involved with them since late 2012. Uh, I currently chair their Global Men's Health Advisory Committee. And uh, they have, over the past several years, uh, especially recently, funded a lot of really great grassroots you know, research where people from the community have come up and said, we're working with men and, you know, we think we can help them to decrease their social isolation, to decrease their loneliness, to, you know, to increase their, uh, you know, their mental health in these really creative ways. And to see the enthusiasm coming up from the, the grassroots community to try and support men, to me suggests that uh, you know, maybe some of my cynicism is uh, maybe a little bit uh, you know, misdirected and, uh, and maybe you know, there's, uh, 
there's some potential for growth here. And uh, it's, it's tough when you've been a cynic all your life, you know, it's, it's tough <laughs> becoming a bit of an optimist, you know, after a while. So uh, I'm approaching it cautiously. So let me ask you a personal question, if you don't mind. How, yeah. how has this played out in, in your own life? Like, were you, did you feel the same kind of pressure? Did you have to overcome that at some point? Did that, is that one of the things that, are some of those experiences, were they a crucible that led you to down the path where you're at right now? Actually, the opposite. Um, I've always been intrigued by, you know, by the men in my environment who feel the need to conform the most because I, I never really felt the need to conform to a lot of traditional male role norms. But that's not saying all of them, but but some of them, you know, I really don't feel the need to conform. So, uh, yeah, but mind you, I just said earlier that, yeah, yeah, you know, when it comes to some of my health-related behaviors, uh, yeah, you know, I, those I'm, you know, I'm up with. But, uh, but for example, I went into, uh, into psychology. I'm a social psychologist by training. Um, yeah, so I have a doc. I have a PhD in social psychology, uh, and uh, at the time, psychology, you know, was kind of a, a bit of a of a balanced, you know, fee, a, a balanced area about an equal number of men and women. But right now, I went into the gender field because I was interested in gender role socialization, and I was one of the few men, you know, in the area of gender role socialization, and uh, you know, and that. That really didn't bother me, but uh, I talked to you know some of my other you know uh, you know friends who are in more traditionally male dominated you know fields, and uh, and I kind of get queries from them saying it's like yeah yeah you know, how, how do you how do you handle being you know sort of the only man you know uh, you know in the room at uh, at uh, you know say at a conference or something or one of the few men in a room at a conference, and uh, yeah so, and other aspects of my life too so for yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like, and also kind of like you, I'm just kind of like, hmm, you know, what are, you know, what am I feeling? What are, what are my emotions? You know, uh, how did I get here? Um, you know, do I, do I look at who I am and what I am very closely? Probably not. So, yeah. So I, it's, it's really funny, you know, how I got here. It's just. Well, here, here we are. That's so uh, actually I have a question about gender, which I, because I have these, it's funny, I have these conversations with my kids now because my kids are, they're, I mean, it's, I guess this is just a natural consequence. This is a cycle of life, right? But all of a sudden you get to a point and your kids are teenagers and they're like, what are you talking about? Like, so they, they look at gender as a very fluid concept, right? So they got kids that are, you know, gender fluid. They got these, you know, trans kids and it's not even a thing for them. So, but I think that what happens, I, I myself don't understand the concept of gender deeply enough. Like before this sort of, these things started happen, before I started to hear about them on the radio and stuff like that, I, I thought gender was simply a biological identity, you know, male or female, but, and, and I, I don't, that obviously must be part of it, but how, how do you define gender as an, as an idea? Oh, Jason, I don't know whether I'm able to answer that question because I'm kind of like you. Uh, I, I know based on what I read uh, that, uh, you know, the gender is not the binary that we used to think it is. And, and I, you know, and so I, I understand that and I know that, um, but how we, how we understand the fluidity. I don't, I haven't done enough reading in the area to really offer uh, an intelligent opinion, you know, on that. Uh, there was an article that uh, I believe it was in Nature that uh, came out uh, recently that I've got on my list of papers to read and, uh, and I'm hoping to do. I do know that, um, you know, that the, you know, that the medical community and the scientific community you know, uh, is working to go beyond what we call the gender binary, the male-female binary, and to understand more, you know, about, uh, you know, people who uh, who do not identify, you know, as male or female. But I, one thing I do know is that there is often a tendency, you know, amongst people who don't understand the area to conflate, you know, uh, this notion of gender fluidity with sexual orientation, and I know that that's wrong, 
you know, that, uh, and, I, and I also, but I also kind of know historically where that came from, because back in the 1930s, when people were talking about masculinity and femininity, they were equivalent, they were synonyms for men and women. So in other words, men were masculine and women were feminine. And there was, there were boxes that you ticked. There was no room for any middle ground. And if uh, you weren't entirely masculine and you weren't entirely feminine, then that was something clinical. You know, uh, and we now know that that is not clinical because we've come a long way in our understanding. But uh, again, how that has evolved over time, I just don't have a firm enough understanding with. Uh, I have several colleagues who do, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I find it a, a fascinating area and I think it's a very important area, uh, especially for example, when it comes to things like healthcare. And, um, and for example, just dealing with the trans community, for example, you know, um, how, how do they, how do they interact with the healthcare system? What are their specific challenges in interacting with the healthcare system? What kind of education and training do physicians need? Just a general physician, even, you know, uh, to deal effectively with someone in that community. And then within the psychological health community, you know, if you have someone you know, with a, a fluid gender identity, you know, uh, coming, you know, to you, how does that have an impact on how you may treat them as well? Um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a fascinating area. It kind of makes me wonder if the words, even the ideas of a, you know, masculine and feminine, if from a language point of view, if the days are numbered, because it seems like such a binary spectrum. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, we do. This is a great thing about uh, building a knowledge base is that is, you know, the, with the more knowledge we have, you know, um, then sometimes the way we view the world changes. You know, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the great child developmentalist Jean Piaget, you know, called it assimilation versus accommodation. So we will take this knowledge and we will assimilate it into our knowledge structures until a point comes where it no longer fits because, you know, uh, we need to change that knowledge structure to adjust to all this new information we're getting. And that's called accommodation. And so and that's kind of you can sort of use that as a parallel to understand how our views of the world they change with the increased understanding and knowledge that we have. So it could very well be that uh, that a lot of things like this change. And I, I'm a big fan of science fiction, and uh, I think a lot of science fiction writers have been writing about this, you know, for you know for a long time. So uh, for me, it's not a it's not a strange concept because I've been you know reading about it for years. Uh, it's just I think for some people it might be you know new and challenging and potentially even threatening for them. So uh, you know it's uh, you know it's the way forward. So how does how do these roles like trying to conform to these role these you know traditionally masculine roles? What are the implications that you see from a mental health perspective? Hmm. Well, we know, for example, that for example, okay, let's 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 take a look at um, you know just depression as a good example. There was a wonderful review that came out uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, but uh, by a man named Zeidler uh, in Clinical Psychology Review, and he looked at the way men and masculinity you know influence men's both their decision to seek treatment for depression as well as their experiences in getting treatment you know for depression and what they found was that you know a lot of men you know felt that it was important to try and handle the symptoms on their own as much as possible. And that, that was related to the sense of masculinity, the sense of, I can handle this, I can take care of this on my own, I don't need anybody else to, uh, you know, to, to, hand, to, to help me with this. And this over this sense of over self reliance is a key element of, uh, of masculinity in the male role norm, and it can have a negative impact on our ability to seek help when we need it. And then when they when men got into therapy, 
oftentimes they didn't disclose the extent of their symptoms to uh, to the right level. In other words, they didn't disclose everything to the psychologist that they were talking to or the mental health professional they were talking to, you know, for fear of being perceived as weak and not strong. But even before they got in, you know, what happened was, you know, this notion, let's go back to this notion of wanting to deal with it on your own. You know, these men would, in essence, drive themselves to exhaustion, trying to cope with the symptoms of depression. And to the point where by the time they actually got into therapy, they, the symptoms were, you know, more entrenched, but they were exhausted, you know, from trying to cope on their own. And, uh, and that can have a, uh, you know, kind of a, a bit of a negative impact on your ability to, you know, to deal with the therapeutic environment. Um, because, you know, part of what therapy is about, especially cognitive behavior therapy is, you know, um, you need to kind of cognitively restructure the, the problem and you need to, uh, you know, kind of, you know, we call behavioral activation to start doing things that make you happy and, uh, and so forth. And those things work, but sometimes, you know, these men needed a bit of a rest, you know, to get some energy back before they could start, uh, you know, taking this on. So, and again, a lot of this, you know, a lot of this from uh, what we talk to men, they actually link a lot of these activities, these, you know, these things that are kind of damaging to them back to various elements of masculinity. Hmm. So did that answer your question, Jason? That, that did answer my question. It actually leads me to another one. Which one of the things that I see a lot, and I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts about this, but, and it's my, my experience is purely anecdotal, of course, but I talk to a lot of guys that have experienced different levels of trauma in their childhood. And one of the mm -hmm. things that they try to do quite frequently is they, they look at the way the pain they're in right now as an adult and they judge the hell out of that, right? Why yeah. I'm weak for feeling this way and blah, blah, blah. But I think it, I think it ties into, there's a couple of things. One of them is sometimes obviously it's fear of going back and confronting the trauma that they face in whatever, whatever way they might have to do that. They just don't want to reopen that can of worms. But I think in other times it's this, a belief that, that I have to be, that happened so long ago. I've closed the door on that. I've moved past it. I've conquered that trauma, even though they haven't, but that's the, what they tell themselves. And there's no possible way that what happened to me when I was five years old is affecting me as a 40 year old man. And I'm wondering, I'm assuming based on our conversation, masculinity or traditional views of that must have something to do with that. Well, I would question whether or not, you know, a lot of men actually, who have had trauma in their in their earlier lives are actually you know linking that trauma to what's happening to them in the present day um are they aware of what's going on as you you know said earlier a lot of you know a lot of men are just they're cut off from their feelings they're cut off from their emotions they may be aware that something's wrong but they might not know what and they might not know why uh and some men you know, as you say, they might have the sense of awareness to be able to link back to an, an earlier trauma. Um, but then maybe what they're thinking is, I can deal with this. I can deal with this on my own. I don't need help. And uh, that leads, you know, down, you know, down the road to you know, social isolation, you know, to loneliness, to depression, you know, possibly to, uh, you know, increased uh, suicide ideation and, and suicide risk. Um, there are just, there are so many, you know, so many factors there. Um, again, this is also an area where I, I know a little bit about one of my colleagues, Andrew Smiler, has just taken over as, uh, as I, I believe he's the executive director of a, of a national uh, organization in the U.S. that's devoted to, uh, you know, to men dealing with, abuse in earlier lives. So I'm, I'm hoping to be able to, uh, to learn more, you know, about that field and, uh, and the impact that, uh, you know, that that can have, you know, on men later in life, and especially the role that, that masculinity plays in trying to cope, you know, with that. Because the other element here is that n not everybody who experiences trauma is going to experience an adverse outcome as a result. 
you know, this gets into my, my secondary field, which is psychological resilience. You know, as a, as a whole or on the whole, we are f a fairly resilient, you know, uh, you know, type of, uh, you know, group, you know, men, women, et cetera. We do tend to be more resilient. But when you look at the factors that are predictive of adult mental health concerns, self-reported childhood trauma is actually a consistent predictor. But again, it's not a big predictor. So by, by that, I mean that not everybody who was traumatized in childhood you know, will, experience a, will experience adult you know, mental health concerns. So I, I, I don't want to leave people thinking you know, that, oh, just because I've experienced trauma, that means that I'm going to have a psychological difficulty. Uh, I see this a lot, you know, uh, you know, by 15 years in national defense, you know, um, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion, for example, in newspapers around, you know, uh, men and women who are deployed into, you know, a combat zone, that they're going to come back damaged. And the data show that a certain percentage of them will be at risk for depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. But numbers depending on their experiences when they're in theater can be um, as maybe as high as 25 percent but as low as four percent and it's not everybody and the other element that i want to bring up is that there was a, just a fantastic paper released today by my colleagues nick carlton and his group of, of people um, at the university of regina they just did a large massive survey looking at the mental health of uh, you know, public safety personnel, you know, police, fire, ambulance, dispatchers, and um, and they did find increased risks of mental health disorders amongst those who work in those those fields. You know, but the numbers, the overall rates, you know, uh, they are higher than the Canadian norm. But they, you know, these are people who experience you know uh, really bad shit on a regular basis, uh, but they're not all you know they're not damaged basically the majority of them are not damaged they are at risk and this needs to be taken into a fact into account when uh when you put together you know prevention programs you know or you know health and wellness programs in these fields um but anyway well, I, I, I kind of get i kind of get off on a bit of a tangent there or got no, off on a bit of a tangent that's actually great because i was actually i wanted to talk to you about resilience so how do you what's the definition of resilience huh um, okay, let me let my cynical side come back up again. Uh, there is no agreed upon scientific definition for psychological resilience. And with, you know, when you consider that, that means there's no way of measuring it. There's no way of studying it. There's no way of actually uh, determining whether or not any programs that are put together you know, worked to increase resilience. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, we often consider resilience as the ability to bounce back, you know, to our regular selves after experiencing a traumatic or potentially traumatic event, and we that's hard to that's hard to measure. That's hard to what we call operationalize. So, you know, um, bounce back to what we don't have any baseline data, like. We don't have data on everybody who experiences trauma from just before they experience their trauma to, you know, to know when they're going to go back to their former selves. So a lot of researchers have put together various concepts or ideas or theories about what resilience is. So what we do know is that resilience is a process within the individual that helps them to cope with the stressors of the trauma, to mitigate the negative potential negative outcomes of exposure to that trauma so that they actually, you know, come out at the end, you know, psychologically and physically healthy and well. And, but what we don't know is what are those components within the individual that are the most important to study? Hmm. So, so, so are there programs just to, uh, try to wrap my head around that. So, are are programs? Is it possible to? to is resilience born, <laughs> or is it is it nature or nurture? I guess. 
No, it's it's not it's not born. For example, you can have someone who's experienced multiple traumas. And they are just as healthy as someone who's experienced none. And that person who's experienced multiple traumas, you know, they can have a car accident on the way home and that the straw that broke the camel's back. So, you know, so there, there are no resilient people out there. It's, you know, there are differences between people, but there are also differences within people over time. Um, so, but with that said, I think you're asking about other programs. Well, actually, before you go on, yeah, but let me, okay, so that's really interesting. But before you do that, let me ask you a question. So in other words, mm -hmm. resilience isn't, I guess, a measure of a person's resilience is not like throughout the spectrum of their own life, like their whole life. So in other words, I had a, I had something terrible happen to me. It didn't affect me. I had something terrible happen to me. It didn't affect me. I had something terrible happen to me and it, it had a devastating impact on me. So it took me three events to get to that point. Whereas another person might experience one and get to that point. Does that make me more resilient than the other person? No, because you know, what is it that, uh, for example, what was it that you were coping with, you know, at the time of that third trauma? Um, you know, it may very well be that you had a lot on your plate at that time and you were successfully coping with all of that. And then all of a sudden, you know, boom, something else comes along and you no longer have the coping resources to deal effectively with that. That doesn't make you a less a less resilient or an unresilient person. That just means that, you know, in essence, you have, uh, you know, you have met your match, so to speak. You know, you've, uh, yeah, you, you just, you, you've reached the point where you can no longer cope effectively with the stressors that you are experiencing in your, you know, in your life. Now, there may be some people out there who do not have good coping mechanisms, you know, in general, but does that make them less resilient? Well, you know, I, I don't like to throw potential labels out there uh, because we can teach these coping mechanisms. We can teach these, you know, these ways of coping with stressors to people. Uh, the question really then becomes how, in what context, and what's the most effective way to do this. That's really interesting because I, from what I, I've heard a lot of a number of people say, and I've been re actually repeating it because of that is that there's like a spectrum of resilience. But what I'm hearing you saying is there's not really. Is that a fair? Is that a fair summation? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. Like. One of the key elements that uh, that I really like. So, the the what one of the groups that was at the, really at the forefront, you know, of what I would call mental health education. I'm not calling it resilience training. I'm calling it mental health education. Uh, is the was the Canadian Armed Forces, and I was lucky enough to be on the oversight committee that uh, that developed the uh, road to mental readiness training. You know that uh, that the Canadian Armed Forces developed. Eventually, they they handed that over to the Mental Health Commission of Canada, who adapted it and changed it. So they, the Mental Health Commission has a uh, has a model for first responders and a model for non first responders, and they call them two different things, but they're really the same thing. But one of the key elements, you know, within that is the mental health continuum model, and that is that notion that it is not categorical, that it is fluid. That uh, your that your your mental health, you know, lies on a continuum from you know from yellow, sorry, from green to yellow to uh, to amber or to sorry to orange to red, and that you know in any day, month, you know, year, you can you know be, you can be anywhere on that continuum, and uh, anecdotally. Uh, I remember talking to people as part of you know the research you know that I used to do for national defense when I when I worked there, and uh, yeah, I was, I was talking to a bunch of uh, Navy people who had taken it, and they're saying, oh yeah, I was having kind of a yellow day, and uh, and I realized that you know that I, that I'd better uh, you know sort of figure out what's going on with me and try to get myself back in the green, and I thought, wow, okay, that that, that is interesting. So I'm much more of a believer in mental health or you know being on a continuum. And I, again, I really don't like using the word resilience because it is a bit of a buzzword. And uh, programs like the, the Road to Mental Readiness, they don't teach resilience. They teach awareness about mental health and how you can work to maintain it. Um, so 
Back to the the idea of resilience training. Like what what does that what forms can that take and how effective can that be? Or and what are the what are the conditions, I guess, that are required for success? Well, we don't really know because programs aren't necessarily successful. Um, I, in fact, I wrote about this, you know, on a LinkedIn post, um, you know, about almost two years ago, and, and I just reposted it on the weekend and I've been getting a lot of great feedback from it. Uh, there was a wonderful study that came out in 2015 by a group, uh, and this, it was a meta-analysis. So in other words, it was they took all these studies that had evaluated the effectiveness of resilience training programs, and they put them all together because a single study doesn't tell us anything. But if you can bring together multiple studies, multiple data points that are looking at the same thing, and, and if you can find out, you know, just, you know, uh, how effective they are. So what you do is you, you pool your effects from all of these studies, and that gives you, a, in essence, a more robust definition, you know, of, uh, of what is effective and what isn't. That's powerful. And so they did this with these, uh, these resilience uh, studies. And what they found was that overall, they're not that effective. And uh, the overall effect that, it did, that they did have initially was very small. And that even to the point where it, that small effect declined to practically a zero effect after about one month. So I would argue that we really don't know you know, what works for uh, resilience programs yet, because we really haven't built any that have a lot of strong demonstrable effects. Now, with that said, a lot of the elements in a resilience training program, they come from clinical psychology. And in those contexts, in either a one-on-one -on -one clinician, client, or in a group therapy session, the elements of these resilience training programs, you know, things like, you know, breathing, like diaphragmatic breathing, smart, you know, uh, you know, you know, your ability to, uh, you know, to look at and, uh, and, and goal set properly. So these are just two elements, you know, but when you look at, you know, smart goal setting and diaphragmatic breathing at a clinical level, the effects are huge. They're wonderful. They're very effective. But that's within the context of, you know, a one-on-one -on -one or a small group clinical relationship where you're seeing, you know, your clinician on a once a week basis and you're going home and you're practicing, and, you know, and you're practicing, you know, uh, those techniques, you know, over the week, you know, and maybe over uh, a period of months. And, um, you know, there could be a six month follow up, but you are still, you know, in treatment, you know, or you are still, um, you know, you are still, you know, following your treatment, you know, regimen and, and they're effective. But uh, when you try and take those, those behaviors and those skills, and you put them in a group setting, so where you're teaching a group of, say, 20 or 30 people in a small group, you know, these things, a lot of times what ends up happening is, you know, maybe that they don't necessarily practice them when they go home. So they don't really, you know, get a chance to uh, incorporate them into their day to day you know, behavior, or maybe they're just not all that relevant to everybody in the room. So a lot of people in the room don't really, you know, don't really, you know, uh, think, well, I'll save those for later. But they forget about them when later comes. So we don't really know. But we do know, again, that in a clinical setting, they're very effective. But when we try and translate them into a, uh, you know, into a work, into a, like a resilience training environment, they're not all that effective. I wonder when I when I hear you say that I mean I wonder how much of what seems to me to be just my own personal experience to be uh, at least effective and kind of obvious in a way is the things like you know having having a band of brothers for example you know or or having a dragon to slay like having a purpose in your life or understanding your core values and having practices in your life that help you live in alignment with your core values like to me those things must i can't see how they could make you they could negatively impact your resilience you know does, does any of that kind of stuff ever studied or oh yeah definitely um let's talk about the band of brothers element you know there have been decades of research looking at the impact of what we would call social support, you know, on health and well-being. And we know 
that the more social support, the more satisfied people are with their social support network, you know, the help happier and healthier they are. And but here's the other thing: what we do know is that as people get older, especially men, that social support network dwindles. So that brings us back full circle to what we talked about initially, and that was social isolation. So as we get older, especially as men get older, they their band of brothers tends to decrease to the point where it may not be helpful or effective anymore. And uh, and as a result, you know, uh, you know, a lot of men may not have the ability to seek out help from a trusted friend or friends. Uh, they may not go out and do things with groups of people like they used to do in the past. They may become socially isolated. So that I think is one of the uh, is one of the key, you know, elements to uh, you know to resi- if you want to talk about resilience, but let's talk about just more mental health more uh, more broadly. That's interesting. Why does it? You know, it's funny you say that because I've actually been here. We've been talking about this in some of the groups that I run about this idea that you know as men get older, our social circle tends to dwindle. Why does that? Mm-hmm. In, in your view, why does that happen? Just life gets in the way. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Again, I'm not aware of any research that has explored why that happens, but there's one element I'd like to test, uh, if I could. And uh, that would be that a lot of men's friendships are people they work with. Uh, And because a lot of men's identity is really wrapped around what they do for a living. And as we get older, uh, a lot of times people, who friends we may be made at work, they'll move on to another job or will move on to another job. And we don't necessarily keep up with, uh, you know, with the people that were important for us because we don't see them on a day-to-day basis anymore. And as we get older, I think it becomes harder for us to make friends. I don't know why. Uh, and I don't know whether, you know, women experience that degree of difficulty as they get older, as, as same as men do. Again, that's, that's a question I'd love to test you know, from, you know, scientific perspective, uh, because, you know, I think that, uh, that, that, I think that in, in my mind, that's, that's what makes sense. You know, that's my personal observation and, uh, and I'd like to see whether or not I'm right. So we got a little bit of ego involved there too, right? For sure. For sure we do. Wow, Don, this has uh, just been a great discussion. Is there before we wrap up? Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to touch on before we go? You know, Jason, I'm just uh, interested in starting a discussion. You know, especially around you know men, masculinity, their physical health, their psychological well being. You know, ways in which we can sort of really start turning the conversation around to you know uh, the positive elements of masculinity. And, uh, you know, improving men's overall well-being, you know, within, within our culture. And as I said earlier, there's, this is something that is, is fairly new. It's been growing since the mid-80s. And I'd like to find a way to do it in a, in a constructive. But also I'm very, I find, for me, evidence-based is very important. Because we can all have great ideas about why something works and why something doesn't work. But what I know as a scientist is that a lot of times those ideas just don't pan out. And uh, so I'm a big believer in evidence base. And uh, so that's th- th- that for me is, is one thing that I'm trying to add to the discussion as well. You know, trying to not only spark the discussion forward, but identify what is scientifically valid and, you know, and what's just... Uh, potentially observational bias. No, I think that's great. It really makes me happy to, you know, to realize the more conversations like this I, that I have, how many different, you know, perspectives that are being looked into, you know, whether it's, whether it's guys forming communities, whether it's scientists, you know, doing analysis, experiments, doing analysis on data, whether it's just, it, there's so much amazing work going on that is, that is, contributing to our body of knowledge and also helping change the culture. So, and you're doing some of that work and it just, every time I talk to people about this, it just brings me hope because there's just so many more options available for our kids than there were, you know, when we were kids. So 
uh, oh, I think it's great. And, definitely. And I applaud the I applaud the work you're doing. It's so so important. So well, Don, yes. sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to uh, to be honest. I just lost my train of thought. So you're good. <laughs> Well, hey, listen, for people that are interested in finding out more about you, and I'm sure many of our listeners uh, will be interested in doing that, what is the best way for them to learn more about your work and uh, what you're up to right now? The best way really is to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, so I'm just Don McCreary at, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I actually, I'm just, I, you know, um, yeah, so you can just, you can find me. It's Don McCreary, PhD, you know, consultant in men's health, work stress, health and resilience, etc. So you can find me there, connect with me there. And, uh, you know, if, um, you know, if you need to connect with me, just message me and, uh, you know, and away we go. Uh, read through some of my stuff. Uh, I post uh, a couple articles you know, most weekdays and uh, hopefully people find those helpful. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm always, you know, I'm a consultant, so I'm happy to, uh, you know, to come and do a workshop, uh, do some training, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, yeah, figure out if there's, if there's something I can do for you. Yeah, absolutely. We'll post a, a, a link directly to your LinkedIn profile uh, in the show notes page. And one thing, one last request, I want the headshot that you are going to send me to be you in your full Movember glory. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's that's not going to happen because I, I have a full okay. beard, okay, and okay, okay. Uh, so the, my full November glory would mean shaving some of that off. And uh, that's just, you know, that's just not, it, not in the cards. Well, the, the the ironic thing is, you know, it's like yeah, uh, I don't know what it is. You know, I went years without having a beard, and then I kind of grew one, and now I just can't picture myself without it. So uh, that's how I am it too. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I don't know why. Because and here's the ironic thing: is that one of the main contributions that I've made to the study of the psychology of men and masculinity is in the area of body image. So, uh, is this a body image element that uh, that I'm just not aware of? So, now, my mind just goes in strange directions when uh, when I'm forced to think too much. So. Uh, you know, I, that's something I'd love to have you on to talk about again, because I'm really fascinated about body image, because one of the things that I do, like, it's funny, everybody knows this about me that follows me online. But uh, when I one of the things I do a lot is I post a lot of shirtless selfies of me working out. But it's funny, because <laughs> one of the reasons I do that is because it hasn't it's actually has nothing to do with any type of uh, anything other than wanting to show guys that you like being a vulnerable, authentic, emotional, and sensitive human being does not have to be mutually exclusive to being physically strong and fit, right? So if I was if I was a guy who was espousing the same message, uh, but I was wearing skinny jeans and sipping a latte at Starbucks, I would. It's not that my message would be any less valid, but it would connect with a different audience. So, but I would love to have you back on to talk about that because it's something that I find fascinating and I, I deal with myself even to this day. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because I spent my thirties and uh, and early forties as a gym rat, and uh, I injured myself, and uh, now I don't necessarily have the body that uh, that I had before that I you know sometimes would like. But uh, so you know, as soon as you said that, I was, the first thing that went to my mind is we need to do one of those um, those. Um, you know, comparisons with, you know, with shirtless you and shirtless me. And uh, the, 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 we could be a comedy team. Let's put it that way. <laughs> there you, you go. Know, hey, you're the, the you know, are you're the fit person. And, and I've got the totally unfit bot these days. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's only temporary. So, hey, listen, thank you so much for doing this. I'm really glad we crossed paths. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you again, Don. Thanks so much. My pleasure. I just hope that, uh, you know, your listeners find what I had to say uh, helpful. Oh, I'm sure they will. Okay, take care. You too. Bye-bye. And there you have it. So if you haven't figured out that there's a different way to be a freaking awesome dude by this point, you're beyond hope, okay? You're absolutely beyond hope. If you're sitting on the couch in your spaghetti-stained shirt with your beer gut hanging over, burping and farting and screaming and swearing at your kids and your wife, thinking that makes you a man, you are kind of an idiot. That's my take on it. So, um, But regardless, 
take advantage of the resources available to you, whether it's this podcast or there's a million other ones like the, the Dead Edge Alliance, for example, that I mentioned at the beginning. And open your eyes and see that there is an entirely different way of being a man. And that way of being a man isn't weak. It's actually what makes you powerful and influential and and connected, right? So, um, yeah. So thanks, Don. Thanks for the work you're doing. And thanks for being smart. Very, very smart. And uh, for those of you who are struggling, I want you to know, guess what? I've fucking struggled too. And I think I might be getting sick of saying this, actually. I think, I think this might be the last time I say this line. I think I might be, have to come up with something else. But I always mean it. If you're struggling and you want to talk to me, I won't judge you. But I feel like there might be something else I'm saying. It's funny how this personal growth thing works. You know, you say something that feels good and then you say it and it starts to not feel good as you change as a person. And you want to say something else or use different words or language to describe what you're thinking or what you're interested in. So we'll see. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed the episode. As always, there will be more coming up. And stay tuned for an exciting announcement coming up about the Mental Health Warriors podcast.